and just made an HTTP request from the client side JavaScript code that I downloaded a minute ago back to their servers, presumably checking for more tweets. And there might not be new tweets, but they're at least polling their servers to check for some amount of time. And indeed, if I click on this request, we won't go into much detail here on this, but you can see all of the HTTP headers. You can see exactly what came back in their response. Apparently, there were more items. There's a key called has more items. So Twitter is actually using JSON, JavaScript object notation, instead of XML. But any site, if you are a Facebook user, Gmail, Gchat user tonight, use Chrome, log into one of those websites, and just watch the network tab of the Chrome inspector, and you'll see pretty constant traffic. Certainly, if there's a busy site or if you're chatting back and forth with friends, you'll see all of these HTTP requests. This is arguably what makes the web or web development really interesting these days, and in that you can make much, much more dynamic sites as a result. So this site, as we'll see, allows me to get a stock quote. Let me type in something like G-O-O-G, which is the ticker symbol for Google, get quote, and there's an error with the AJAX call. So why might this be? So let me go back over here to my, oh, let's see how to do this. Um, let's open AJAX 0. Uh -huh. Ah, that's why. Typo. G-O-O-G, -O -O get quote. There we go. So I renamed the file earlier and forgot to change it in the HTML. So apparently, as of 4.30 PM or so today, the Google stock price is $869.79. So I did not know that in advance, though technically I could have just hard coded this, I suppose, after 4.30 PM for a 6.30 class. But this was, in fact, fetched dynamically. And if you use the same demo tomorrow morning, you would get a different answer slightly. And certainly for other websites, we could get back different stock quotes. So let's see how this is working underneath the hood. If I view the page source, let's scroll down to the easier part first. There's some HTML at the bottom. And it's really just a super simple form that borrows some of the lessons learned from earlier on submit call what function. Quote, this isn't a built-in function. This is apparently one I wrote up above that we'll look at in a second. Return false so that it doesn't actually submit to the server in the traditional way. So AJAX is all about sending data to the server. It's just I don't want it to be submitted via that form per se. I want it to be submitted via my code, my event handler up above. So this symbol is an input. Autocomplete is off. It has an ID of, let's scroll to the right quote unquote symbol, that's probably going to be useful. So I can uniquely identify what the user typed in. So let me zoom out and scroll back up. And you're going to see some mess of a code. And here, too, jQuery will make our lives better. So at the top of my script tag, I have a variable called XHR, could have called it anything, XML HTTP request, initializing it to null, just so that the variable exists for me. Down here, I have a function called quote with some simple comments above it to remind me. And now we have kind of a mess of code that, again, is dramatically simplified by libraries. But I'm going to try to instantiate a new XML HTTP request object. If something goes wrong, something called an exception is going to be thrown. The browser specifically, if it has no idea what this symbol is, XML HTTP request, because I'm using Netscape 1.0 or many versions of IE, it will throw an exception that I am prepared to catch. If I do catch it, I am going to reasonably, but not definitively, assume that it's what browser? Yeah. So there's a lot of this kind of code on the internet, because IE 6 and 7 and 8 and 9, to some extent, have not always played so nicely with certain standards. And all the browsers kind of cut corners here and there. But this is just an example of error checking code. And what jQuery will do for us in just a few moments is collapse all of this messiness and all of this care about what browser the user is using into a simple function call. But what's really going on underneath the hood is something like this. So this is raw JavaScript code. I proceed to check. If the XHR object is null, then I'm going to return an alert saying Ajax is not supported in your browser. But we didn't see that. And then down here, I'm going to do just a little bit more work to make this magic happen. I'm going to declare a variable called URL whose value is quote.php. It happens to be written in PHP, but that's just because it's a language I know. It's, I'm running it on a PHP-supported server. XAMPP comes with support for PHP. Question mark symbol equals, and then what am I concatenating on is the value of that URL, its parameter, 
whatever the symbol's value is that the user typed into the DOM. So the only thing new in this example, besides the exception handling stuff, is the fact that I'm using PHP. But we're not even going to look at the PHP code. Just know that it's returning dynamically a price using some PHP code talking to Yahoo Finance in real time. So Yes, we will simplify all this code in a moment with jQuery to get rid of most of these lines. So the last thing I need to do is actually contact the server. All I've done thus far is create a string, a variable, that is a URL. Now I need to do something with that URL. So I need these three lines. My XHR object, which again is my sort of gateway to the server for this feature called Ajax. Horrible property name, on ready state change. What am I going to call? Call my handler function. So in a moment, we'll see a function called handler. And this is just my way of saying, hey, a special object, when you change state, when you turn on, when you turn off, call this function so I can check what's going on, is what that boils down to. Open is opening a TCP connection to the server, uh, HTTP specifically connection, using the get method, if familiar. If not, don't worry. It's the opposite of post. To this URL, making the call asynchronous. Asynchronous means this function will return immediately. And handler will get called when the server, if the server eventually replies. By contrast, if we made this false and said make the open call synchronous, that would mean that this function open would not return until the server answered back to me, which is not what we want. We don't want the whole page to lock up just in case the server is slow. Finally, send null just means I have no more arguments, no post data, just send the request. So some number of milliseconds, seconds, minutes, hours later, the handler function will get called because the state of this object will change just because the network responds with, the server responds with an answer. What does handler do? It's pretty straightforward. It first checks this, and you would only know this from looking in the documentation, if the ready state value of the object is 4. So there's literally a cheat sheet. 4 is good. 4 means the whole thing is done. The request went, it came back, it's been examined, and it's ready for you. If you're in request state 4 and the server's response was 200, 200 is the opposite of something like 404, 403, 401, 500 error codes that if you ever see them are bad. 200 is one you never see because it's good, literally OK. The request worked. Then go ahead and alert the user with a window to xhr.response text. And again, you'd only know this from looking at the documentation. Response text is the value of whatever the server spit out. And in this case, all the server spit out was 800 and some odd dollars, just a super simple text string. In the case of Google Maps, it would have spit out a ping or a JPEG or a GIF. In the case of Facebook, it would have spit out a status update. In Twitter, it would spit out a tweet and so forth. In this case, it's just a stock price. So how can we simplify this code? Well, let me go into a slightly cleaned up version. Oh, sure. It was just a stupid mistake on my part. If I go into the source of Ajax 0, I'll, oh, I'll, you'll have to fix this as well. And I'll fix this tonight online and re-upload the file. I had accidentally called the file quote1.php, but it's actually quote.php. I renamed it earlier. So I'll fix that permanently. Ajax1.html. So here is a version that we have not looked at its source code, but you can kind of guess that this is a little better. In what sense is this example about to be better designed? Yeah. Yeah. No annoying alert. We're kind of doing something that approximates the idea of what Twitter and Facebook do is that they update the DOM. They change the contents of the web page itself by inserting new data dynamically. So where I say to be determined, let's hope that's actually true. First, let me look at the source and make sure I didn't mess up the file name. It's OK. I did correct this one earlier. So now if I type in Goog, get quote, the page has dynamically updated itself. If I reload the page, notice it goes back to its defaults. And now let me show you one other feature of Chrome's inspector. And again, different browsers have this in different forms. I'm going to go ahead and control click or right click on the word determined, or really anywhere in that area. I'm going to click inspect element. And notice what happens. By default, I'm already on this elements tab. But if I, and I'll zoom in in a moment, if I choose inspect element, notice that the browser very helpfully expanded the HTML in this inspector tab and highlighted the actual HTML that I asked to, it to inspect. So no matter how messy your HTML is, which it shouldn't be, 
this inspector shows you everything beautifully hierarchically, essentially giving you a navigable version of the DOM. This is the tree, and it's indented exactly as it should be to convey the notion of hierarchy. So, watch what happens now. It's going to be a little small, so I'm going to、uh, do it this way. I'm going to type in G O O G. I'm not going to hit enter or submit yet. I'm going to scroll down to the bottom here. And now I'm going to hit enter while this is on screen. And what do you expect should happen to the actual DOM, which again, the inspector here is showing me? It should actually change. That rectangle's value should be changed from to be determined to $800 something. So here we go, enter. And indeed, it actually changed. So this probably didn't take much effort because we're just replacing the alert function with something slightly more elegant. And indeed, if I go into my handler function, Notice there's only one real change. I've replaced my alert line with this guy here document.getElementById of quote unquote price. But wait a minute, we haven't seen a price ID before. But you can probably infer where is it probably? The text, which text? The to be determined. So let's actually go to the HTML because I must have made some other change here. Oh, interesting. So price colon, it does say to be determined. And there was a boldface tag, but I also wrapped it with an inline element, a span element, which is like a div, but it doesn't force a line break. And I gave it arbitrarily, but usefully, an ID at value of price so that I can uniquely identify that string there. So now up above, let's see what the rest of this line is. Get element by ID of price dot inner HTML. So there's different ways of doing this, and this is somewhat of a, the kludgy approach. The right way to do this would be to create a new text node, to remove the old text node, insert or append the new text node, and it would take three lines of code. It actually tends to be slower, at least if you're doing this for lots of nodes in a DOM, like a Facebook or a Twitter does. Inner HTML literally just says cram the new content. Where the old HTML should be without actually parsing it like DOM objects. So this gets the job done here. If I scroll to the right, I'm just pushing the response text, the $800 string, into the innermost HTML of that span, which is why we saw the DOM element update a moment ago. So if we do it again to recap now with that context, and I pre type in Goog, I don't hit enter yet, but I instead scroll down to where it says pre to be determined. Is the span tag going to be replaced or the bold tag? Just the bold tag, because when I uniquely identify the span element by its ID called price and change its inner HTML, that won't blow away the span tag itself, just its inner HTML, which is apparently a bold face tag and a line of text to be determined. So if I hit enter, Sure enough, that changes. It would be somewhat counterproductive if the act of updating the span tag with the unique ID of price has the effect of blowing away that span tag with the unique ID, because then I could never update it a second time, maybe a minute or so later, if I actually did this in a loop with a timer. All right, let's clean this up ever so slightly more. In Ajax2.html, if I view the source here, notice that I've done away with. Quote.php. The one thing I don't like about those previous two demos is that it requires that I be running a web server that supports PHP, that I have written in advance a file called quote1.php, and that three, the reader, knows something about PHP to actually look at it. In reality, it's a super short file. It's not hard to understand, but it's still a dependency. If the whole point, at least of this portion of the course, is to do client side development and not have to get tied down to some language like Java or Python or Ruby or PHP, it'd be nice if we can eliminate my PHP dependency altogether. Now, the The catch is that there's a problem. Yahoo, as I said before, is the one supplying the data. Long story short, Yahoo Finance lets you grab data in CSV format, sort of poor man's Excel format, which is nice because it's just text and I can parse it by splitting on the commas that separate the values. The problem, though, is that because of a policy called the same origin policy, when you write JavaScript code and you query a server like Yahoo for data using JavaScript, Yahoo can reply to you and give you that stock price, but you are not allowed typically to do anything with the value that involves manipulating your DOM. In other words, if you have a DOM from your own server, from the HTML, 
and you're running some JavaScript code that talks to Yahoo, and Yahoo says, here's a piece of data for you, you cannot add that piece of data to your own DOM. It sort of breaks a, a barrier that's meant to exist between your site and others so that certain threat scenarios don't necessarily arise. This is obviously kind of a problem. I worked a 